Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for coming to another Graphs and Matroid seminar. Uh, today we have Dylan Mayhew from, uh, oh, what is it? the University of um, Wellington? Uh, yep. In Sorry, Zealand? I have yeah. that on the slide, but it's known as Victoria University of Wellington. But I've decided to decolonize my slides. Sure, sounds good. Thank you, Dylan. And uh, he's going to be talking about matroids that are transversal and co-transversal. Uh, go ahead, Dylan. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, so let me just uh, start by saying a, uh, a big thank you to everybody who's worked on this uh, seminar series over the last 18 months. It's been very enjoyable for me to be able to tune into the community every week, and I'm sure other people feel the same way. And it uh, takes a lot of effort to keep something like this running for 18 months. So a uh, big thank you to Shayla and also to Rose, both of whom I know have worked uh, very hard on organizing this series. Okay, so um, I am going to talk about uh, a class of matroids that I've been interested in for a while now. Uh, so it's a class of matroids that are transversal and co-transversal. This is a mysterious class. There aren't a lot of theorems about this class. There's a lot we don't know about the class. So this is gonna be a talk with a lot of questions, some conjectures, and not all that many theorems but I hope it will be of interest. Okay, so let me start at the very beginning and just define transversal matroids. So imagine that we've got a bipartite graph G and I'm going to choose E to be the set of vertices on one side of that bipartition. Okay, so E is going to be the ground set of a matroid. And now in order to define the matroid, I need to define something like the independent sets of that matroid. So I'm going to define the independent sets via matchings of the bipartite graph. So I will imagine that I've chosen a subset of E, X is a subset of E as highlighted here. And I'll say that X is matchable if there is some matching of the bipartite graph, which is incident with all the vertices in X. So I've highlighted X, those are the red vertices, and I've highlighted a matching, whoops, I've highlighted a matching in green. And this matching shows that that set X is matchable. There is a matching of the graph, which is incident with all the vertices in X. But notice that if I extended X to include the vertex to the left, then I've got four vertices in that set, and those four vertices have, have only three neighbors on the other side of the bipartition. Uh, so Hall's theorem, or you know, just common sense, tells you that that set is not matchable. So X is matchable, but this set here is not matchable. So that's the distinction we're going to rely upon in order to define our transversal matroid. Dylan, is what, is what you just said true? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, was it? They only have three neighbors. Uh, I think that one, two. Oh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> um, somebody can find a non-matchable set for me. Uh, there's got to be one. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, look. This set definitely not matchable. I think we can all agree on that, right? All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. Um, suffice it to say that some subsets of E are going to be matchable, and others are not. Uh, by virtue of Hall's theorem. Now, the finer details about which sets are matchable and which sets are not matchable, I will leave to the, um, to the, the, the bean counters. Um, can't expect me to actually apply the theorems that I'm talking about. Um, anyway, okay, so this notion leads to the, uh, a, a matroid. This is a, discovered by Edmonds and Fulkerson in the 60s. So, I start from a bipartite graph G. E is one side of the bipartition. That's the ground set of the matroid. The independent sets of the matroid are exactly the subsets of E that are matchable. Okay, so this is indeed a matroid. Any matroid that arises in this way is transversal. Okay, so that is uh, the definition of transversal matroids, but I'm going to talk about. Um, matroids using a kind of geometric perspective. 
which might be less familiar to some. So let me go over it in a, a bit of detail. Okay, so what does a transversal matroid look like geometrically? So the transversal matroids geometrically are exactly the matroids that you can draw by placing points freely onto the faces of a simplex. Okay, so there's a bunch of stuff I need to explain in there. Uh, right, so what does a simplex look like? If I'm drawing a matroid in two dimensions, then a simplex is just going to be a triangle. So I can now draw my transversal matroid by placing elements freely onto the faces of that triangle. So the faces include the edges of the triangle. So I'll place elements freely onto the edges of the triangle. Uh, the faces include the entire two-dimensional space. So I can put elements freely into the two-dimensional plane. The faces include the corners, the vertices of the triangle. So I can place elements freely on those corners. Okay, uh, now, just a, a quick refresher on ge how geometric pictures of matroids work, if you're not familiar with that. Um, the way to understand a picture like this is to think of the dots that I've drawn. Those are the elements of the ground set. And the bases of the matroid, which is to say the maximal independent sets, the bases are exactly the sets of cardinality three that are non-collinear. Okay, so for example, this set here is non-collinear, that is a basis of the matroid. This set here is collinear, that is not a basis of the matroid. So a set is independent in the matroid if and only if it is contained in a set of cardinal C3 that is non-collinear. And that idea extends to other dimensions as well. Okay, so I'm about to draw a matroid in three-dimensional space and in that case, the bases are exactly the, cardinal, the sets of cardinality four that are non-coplanar. That's how to understand these geometric drawings. Uh, I've also said that I'm placing points as freely as possible on the faces of the simplex. So what I mean by that is that they are in general position. So I don't get collinearity such as that, such as the one I've highlighted there. Uh, the only collinearities, the only coplanarities, the only geometric dependencies are the ones that are forced by the faces of the simplex. So, for example, these points are forced to be collinear by the faces of the simplex. That's what I mean by placing them as freely as possible. Okay, so if I were doing this in three-dimensional space, I'd be placing points freely onto the edges of this tetrahedron. I'd be placing points freely in the three-dimensional space. I'd be placing points freely onto the vertices of the tetrahedron. I'd be placing points freely onto, well, uh, the, the faces of that tetrahedron, which is a little bit harder to draw. Okay, so that's a geometric understanding of, of how transversal matrix work. Right, now transversal matrix have been around for a while. They have been well studied. But there's something still a little mysterious about them. We know a lot less about transversal matroids than we do about, say, graphic matroids or matroids representable over a finite field. And uh, one of the principal reasons for that is that the class of transversal matroids doesn't have some of the nice properties that the class of, let's say, binary matroids does. In particular, the class of transversal matroids is not closed under duality. So the dual of transversal matroid may not be transversal. Here's an example. Uh, so this is a transversal matroid. I've placed those six elements freely onto the edges of a tetrahedron in three-dimensional space. Okay, so what is this matroid? It's got six elements. The bases are all the sets of cardinality four, except for that plane, that plane, and that plane. Okay, so that means that the basis complements are exactly the sets of cardinality two, with the exception of this pair, this pair, and this pair. Okay, so then what is the dual of this matroid? It is a rank two matroid. The bases have cardinality two, and the bases are all the pairs with the exception of those three pairs. 
So this is going to be a rank two matroid that looks like this. Now, is this transversal? Well, no, it's not. We can see that it's not transversal just by using the intuition, the geometric intuition I was talking about a moment ago. Uh, how could I possibly make this a transversal matroid? I'd have to place these points freely onto the faces of a simplex. Well, this is going to be a simplex in one dimensional space. Now, simplex in one dimensional space is just a line segment. So how many vertices are there in a line segment? Well, there are the two ends of the line segment. Okay, And because these points are in the same location, they are parallel to each other, this pair needs to be on a vertex of the simplex. This pair needs to be on a vertex of the simplex. And so does this pair. Okay, So I've got three pairs that need to be placed on three different vertices, but there are only two vertices of the simplex. So this matroid cannot be transversal. Okay, so the class of transversal matroids not closed under duality. So from now on, I'll say that a matroid is co-transversal if it's dual is transversal. And the class that I'm going to be talking about is the class of matroids that are both transversal and co-transversal. So it's the intersection of the classes of transversal matroids and co-transversal matroids. Uh, just as an observation, I'll point out that the class of transversal matroids also fails to be closed under taking minors. Um, here's another simple example. I've drawn this transversal matroid by placing points freely onto the faces of a simplex. And imagine what happens if I contract this point here. Um, I'm going to project from this point down onto one dimensional space these pairs will remain parallel pairs. So I'm going to get exactly the same matroid that I had on the previous slide. And we've already explained why that matroid is not transversal. Okay, so this minor of a transversal matroid fails to be transversal. All right, so there are some problems when it comes to studying transversal matroids. It fails, the class fails to be closed under duality. It fails to be closed under taking minors. That makes life harder. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the intersection of the two classes of transversal matroids, co-transversal matroids. I'm going to call those matroids in that intersection bi-transversal. So bi-transversal means transversal and co-transversal. Um, I think I'm borrowing that terminology from Joe Bonin. Um, as far as I know, he, he introduced that terminology. Uh, okay, so my subject is going to be bi-transversal matroids. And I think it's an interesting class because where the class of transversal matroids and the class of co-transversal matroids, those classes, I believe, are fairly wild. They are wild in the same kind of way that the class of real representable matroids is, is quite wild. Whereas the intersection of those two classes, the classes of bi-transversal matroids, I think there are reasons to believe that that class should be tamer. It should behave a little bit more like, say, the class of binary matroids or the class of graphic matroids. Obviously, it's not an exact comparison. The class of bi-transversal matroids is not closed under minors. So it can't be exactly like you know, familiar classes like the classes of binary matroids. But I, I think there are some qualitative ways in which the class of bi-transversal matroids is tamer than the class of transversal matroids and co-transversal matroids. And that's what interests me. It's like trying to understand exactly where this class falls on the spectrum between tame behavior and wild behavior. Okay, so I'll try to explain why I've sort of arrived at this belief by talking about bi-transversal matroids in a variety of different contexts. And I'm going to start by talking about decidable theories. OK, so to understand decidable theories, we need to fix a logical language that is making statements about a class of mathematical objects. So a logical language, that means that it is a formal language, so it has formal syntactical rules. That means that you can always determine whether a string of symbols is a sentence in this language or not. There is no ambiguity 
about whether some, uh, something is a legitimate sentence or not. And that logical language is capable of making statements about a class of mathematical objects, which could be, say, the class of natural numbers, or it could be a, a class of graphs, or it could be a class of matroids or any other type of mathematical object. Now, what does it mean for that class to have a decidable theory? What it means is that there is a theorem testing machine. Okay, so it means that there exists some finite procedure, which essentially means a Turing machine. So there is some finite procedure, a Turing machine. You can put any sentence in the language into that machine and the machine will do its computation. It will halt, it will always halt in a finite amount of time, and it will give a yes or no answer. If it gives the answer yes, it means that that sentence is true for every object in the class. In other words, the sentence is a theorem for the class. If it gives the answer no, it means that there is at least one counterexample. So there is some object in the class that fails that sentence. So that's what decidability means. Having a decidable theorem means that there is, I'm sorry, having a decidable theory means that there is a theorem testing machine. Now, this is a deeply surprising idea. The idea that a class might have a decidable theory goes against everything in, in 20th century mathematics and logic, right? So Gödel and Turing have told us that there are very sharp limits on the ability of computing machines to tell us things about mathematical truth. Uh, so post-Girdle, post-Turing, it is surprising that any non-trivial class could have a decidable theory. But that turns out to be the case. There are interesting classes which have decidable theories, which have theorem testing machines. Okay, so I can illustrate this with a theorem by CESA. So this is Detlef CESA in 1991. And CESA was considering the theory of minor closed classes of graphs, right? So his class of objects is a minor closed class of graphs and his logical language was the monadic second order logic of graphs. I'm not going to say much about what that language is, just suffice it to say that the monadic second order logic of graphs has been extensively studied. It's got many attractive properties with respect to the theory of computation, and it is capable of expressing many natural properties of graphs. So the monadic second order logic of graphs is a natural language to consider in this context. Okay, so CESA proved that a minor closed class of graphs has a decidable theory relative to this monadic second order language, if and only if the class has got bounded tree width. Now, I think this is one of my favorite theorems. I think it's strikingly beautiful. Uh, I think the reason that I like it so much is that it, it is a bridge between the structural theory of discrete objects, graphs, and the theory of computation and the theory of logical languages. So it is sitting in the intersection of those three areas. And that intersection of areas is, uh, is an intersection that I'm very fond of. Um, I like it a lot. Uh, Caesar's theorem relies on the structural work of Robertson and Seymour in a, in a very fundamental way. And so very roughly speaking, what Robertson and Seymour tell us is that a minor closed class of graphs looks like a bunch of trees or it looks like a bunch of grids. Okay, again, I emphasize that I'm speaking very, very roughly, but essentially a minor closed class of graphs is tree-like or it's grid-like. Those, those are the two options that fall out of the Robertson Seymour structure theory. And it turns out those are exactly the options that you need to have a decidable theory or an undecidable theory. If a class of graphs is tree-like, then the graphs can be processed with a tree automaton. That leads to a decidable theory. If the class of graphs is grid-like, those are exactly the structures that you need to encode the computation performed by a Turing machine. So you think of each row of the grid 
as representing the tape of the Turing machine. So each row represents the tape of the Turing machine at a given moment in time. And then as we move up the rows, we are moving forward in time. We are moving forward in the steps of the computation. So we can encode the entire evolution of that Turing machine tape into a grid, into a graph grid. If you can do that, then you can encode undecidable problems like the halting problem into this class of graphs. And then you lead to having, then you prove that you have an undecidable theorem. Uh, I'm sorry, an undecidable theory. Okay, so Robertson and Seymour tell us that we have essentially two structures, trees or grids. Trees lead to decidable theories. Trees are exactly the structures that lead to decidable theories. Grids are exactly the structures that lead to undecidable theories. Now that is remarkable. I can't see any non-deep reason why the two outcomes from Robertson and Seymour should be exactly the outcomes that we need to encode either decidability or undecidability. It really is remarkable. It's, I think it's one of those very rare occasions when the mathematical universe is actually kind to us for no obvious reason. And that almost never happens. For the most part, the mathematical universe enjoys torturing us. But in this instance, it, it, it just it seems to be kind to us for, and it, and I don't see why it has to be kind to us. I can imagine a world where that it didn't line up so nicely. So that's why this is one of my favorite theorems. Uh, CESA proved this for graphs. And then some years later, Peter Helene and CESA proved a matroid version. Uh, so their theorem is concerned with matroids representable over a finite field. And they proved that a minor closed class of F representable matroids has a decidable theory in the monadic second order logic of matroids, if and only if that class has got bounded branch width. And where CESA's original theory leaned on Robertson and Seymour's structure work, uh, the theorem of Helene and CESA relies on the structural work of Dillon, Herods, and Whittle. Okay, so that's an introduction to decidability. What, what tools do we have that we can apply to transversal matroids? Well, here's a theorem by myself and Daryl Funk and Mike Newman. Uh, I call this a theorem. It's actually really more of an observation. It's, it, this is not difficult if you know uh, something about undecidability of classes of graphs. Okay, so our observation is that if a class of matroids is, uh, if a class of matroids contains all rank three uniform matroids and it's closed under principal extensions, then it has an undecidable theory. Okay, so the reason this works is that, well, uh, the rank three uniform matroids are just points placed freely in the plane. And principal extension means that you can take a flat of the matroid or a closed set of the matroid and then add a point freely onto it. So I might take the flat, the closed set, the line spanned by those two points and add a point freely onto that line. Uh, and then I'll repeat that. I'll take the line spanned by those two points, add a point freely onto that line. I keep on doing this. And the structure that I get looks a bit like a graph. I'm thinking of these points here as representing nodes of the graph. And these points here in the middle of the lines, they are somehow painting a picture of an edge. I'm encoding a binary relation with this picture. So by using this idea, I can paint a picture of all graphs and that because the monadic second order theory of graphs is undecidable, this quickly leads to the observation that this class of matroids also has an undecidable theory. Is there a reason that you, is there a reason that you are saying contains all rank three uniform matroids? Couldn't you just say it contains U33? And then yes, you can get you, are, you are correct. Yep, uh, that would be a, another description. Yeah, because you can, of, of course, you can get all rank three uniform matroids from starting from U33 with and using principal extensions. Um, so this observation doesn't 
actually apply to transversal matroids because transversal matroids are not closed under principal extensions. Um, so to see that, well, I'll, I'll take the line spanned by those two points and I'll put a try placing a point freely on that line. Well, that's not a transversal matroid. There's no way I can make that matroid fit into a simplex and make all the points freely placed on faces of that simplex. So I've stepped outside the universe of transversal matroids by applying a principal extension. But the class of co-transversal matroids is closed under principal extensions. Uh, or equivalently, the class of transversal matroids is closed under co-principal co-extensions. Okay, so what does a co-principal co-extension look like? I need to choose a co-flat of the matroid. So I'll choose this set again, it's a co-flat, it's a flat in the dual matroid. And then I need to lift into a new dimension and I need to place a new point in that new dimension. And then I'm going to lift the points of that co-flat up into that new dimension. Uh, this is hard to do because I've had a coffee this morning and I almost never drink coffee. So it's made me quite jittery. Oh, well, I give up. Um, there we do. There we go. I'll do it the easy way. Okay, so that is a co-principal co-extension. And I can do that in a transversal way. So to extend into the new dimension, I just uh, embed my simplex in a dimension of one higher space. And um, I take a new, uh, a new vertex in the, the higher dimension simplex. And then I'm able to perform that lift in a transversal way. Okay, so the class of transversal matroids is closed under co-principal co-extensions. Uh, the class of co-transversal matroids is closed under principal extensions. And that is enough to show that both classes have undecidable theories. Okay, but the class of bitransversal matroids is different. The class of bitransversal matroids is not closed under either of those operations. It's not closed under principal extensions or co-principal co-extensions. Uh, if I perform either of those operations, I will step outside the world of either transversal matroids or co-transversal matroids. And in that respect, the class of bitransversal matroids is similar to the class of matroids representable over a finite field. So I feel like the class of bitransversal matroids should have properties that are similar to class of matroids representable over a finite field. So I'm going to conjecture that a class of bitransversal matroids with bounded branch width has a decidable theory. Um, I feel pretty confident about this conjecture. We have a partial result. Uh, so we know that the class of fundamental matroids has, if a class of bound, no, I'm sorry, if a class of fundamental matroids has bounded branch width, then it will have a decidable monadic second order theory. Uh, I won't define fundamental matroids because it's not relevant for the rest of the talk, but just suffice it to say that fundamental matroids form a subclass of the bitransversal matroids. So this is a partial result. So are they fundamental transversal matroids? Fundamental transversal matroids, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Every fundamental transversal matroid is bitransversal. So we know that such a class with bounded branch width does have a decidable theory. Okay, so yeah, I would like to see that conjecture resolved. At the moment, I think it's hard, but I'll talk more about that later. Uh, let me skip that slide and move on to the topic of well quasi ordering. So an anti-chain of matroids is just a set of matroids, none of which contains another as a minor and a class of matroids is well quasi ordered if it contains no infinite anti-chain. Uh, so the most famous well quasi ordering result in matroid theory is due to Giel and Herard's Whittle. Uh, the class of F-representable matroids is well quasi-ordered when F is a finite field. 
And note that this fails in a very strong way when F is an infinite field, because you can find an infinite antechain of F representable matroids when F is an infinite field. And furthermore, you can find an infinite antechain of matroids with rank three. So if those matroids have rank three, then they have branch width at most four. So bounding the branch width does not help you over an infinite field. Uh, what about the class of bitransversal matroids? Well, that fails to be well quasi-ordered also because of this infinite antechain here. Uh, this notation maybe looks a little bit complicated, but it's actually quite a simple idea. Uh, you start with two circuits. So for example, this is a circuit of cardinality three, geometrically represented. You take two such circuits and then you truncate them down to rank equal to the size of the circuit. Truncation just means that you throw out all independent sets above a certain size. So I am just going to truncate down to the point where that direct sum of circuits now has rank equal to the cardinality of either one of the circuits. So this is the rank three member of that antechain. If I were to draw the rank four member of the infinite antechain, I would take two planes in three dimensional space, uh, two planes of four elements each and so forth. This is a well-known infinite antechain of matroids and those matroids are bitransversal. So bitransversal matroids are not well quasi-ordered. Um, in fact, I can say something further. Now I'm going to talk about the class of multipath matroids. So this is a, an attractive class of matroids discovered by Joe Bonin and Omer Jimenez in 2007. And multipath matroids are transversal matroids. So they are matroids with a bipartite graph presentation. And the idea is that the ground set of this transversal matroid can be arranged in a cyclic order, like so. And I want the neighborhoods of the other vertices in the bipartite graph. So these vertices here that are not part of the ground set, I want those neighborhoods to all be cyclic intervals in that ordering. And furthermore, I want those neighborhoods to form an antechain with respect to inclusion. So that means that no interval should contain any other interval. No neighborhood should contain any other neighborhood. If those conditions are satisfied, then the matroid is a multipath matroid. And what's attractive about this class is that it is closed under duality and it is closed under taking minus. So because it's closed under duality, that means that every multipath matroid is not only transversal, but it is also co-transversal. So multipath matroids are bitransversal. Uh, okay, so this is an attractive class of bitransversal matroids that is closed under taking minus. And that infinite antechain that I was just talking about a moment ago, that consists of multipath matroids. Here is a multipath presentation of the matroid that I drew just a moment ago. This is a multipath presentation of that matroid in three-dimensional space consisting of two planes of four elements. Okay, so not only is the not only does the class of bitransversal matroids fail to be well quasi-ordered, the class of multipath matroids fails to be well quasi-ordered. But we have this theorem by myself and my uh, PhD student, Minu Maria Joes. Uh, Minu graduated last year. Uh, our theorem says that if you take a class of multipath matroids with bounded branch width, that will be well quasi ordered. And I think that should extend to all bitransversal matroids. I think that if you have a class of bitransversal matroids with bounded branch width, that should be well quasi ordered. So there's a, there's a partial 
result towards that conjecture. Okay, let me move on to the topic of minor closed classes. Uh, the class of bitransversal matroids is not closed under minors. When you've got a class of matroids that's not closed under minors, you can, you can move to a minor closed class in a couple of different ways. Um, one approach is to just take all the matroids in that class and to take all of their minors. So look at that entire class. If we do that with bitransversal matroids, we get the class of gamoids. Gamoids have been around for a while, so we, we don't get anything new in that approach. But there's another approach you can take. You can just look at the largest minor closed class within your class. So let's do that with bitransversal matroids. We can ask, what is the largest minor closed class that consists solely of bitransversal matroids? And so that's equivalent to asking, what are the matroids that are bitransversal and which also have the property that all their minors are bitransversal? Okay, so I'll say that a matroid is strongly bitransversal if it is bitransversal, and so are all the minors of that matroid. And then the class of strongly bitransversal matroids is closed under minors by construction. And in fact, it is the largest minor closed class consisting of bitransversal matroids. So what I'm really asking here is a characterization of the strongly bitransversal matroids. Okay, well, do we know of any strongly bitransversal matroids? Uh, yes, we do, because I just spoke about them a minute ago. I said that every multipath matroid, uh, the class of multipath matroids is closed under minors. So every minor of a multipath matroid is multipath. And multipath matroids are bitransversal. So a multipath matroid is bitransversal, so are all its minors. So multipath matroids are strongly bitransversal. So there's an attractive class of strongly bitransversal matroids. Uh, is that it? Can we hope that that is exactly the class of bi strongly bitransversal matroids? Uh, no, we can't, because the class of multipath matroids is not closed under direct sums. The class of strongly bitransversal matroid is closed under direct sums. So I can, I can find a counterexample by just taking the direct sum of a couple of multipath matroids. It will be strongly bitransversal. It won't be multipath. Um, okay, so what I should be really what I should really be asking is, is it true that every connected strongly bitransversal matroid is every such matroid a multipath matroid? That would be nice, but that too is false. Um, here is a bitransversal matroid. In fact, it's relatively easy to check that this is strongly bitransversal. All its minors are bitransversal. And it's not a multipath matroid. Uh, and the reason that it fails to be multipath is because of this element in the middle sitting freely in the plane. Uh, multipath matroids are kind of allergic to freely placed elements. They don't like them. So, it might be true that if I take a connected strongly by transversal matroid and I insist that it doesn't have any free elements and it doesn't have any free elements in the dual either, maybe that matroid is forced to be multipath. I, I, I find that conjecture plausible, but I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not completely sold on it. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there are counterexamples. Um, it would be nice if this conjecture were true, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to stake that much on it. Okay, so why are these problems hard? I think the reason that they're hard is that there isn't any obvious presentation of a bitransversal matroid. There isn't any obvious presentation that certifies it to be a bitransversal matroid. And that's unfortunate, because if you think about, say, the class of binary matroids, the class of binary matroids, they have presentations that certify them to be binary. Okay, If you look at a binary matrix, it not only represents everything about that matroid, but it tells you that the matroid is binary. Of course it's binary, it's represented by a binary matrix. If you look at a graph, it not only 
tells you everything about the graphic matroid. It tells you that the matroid is graphic. Of course, it's graphic, it's represented by a graph. How do you do that for bitransversal matroids? What presentation of a bitransversal matroid represents the matroid and forces it to be bitransversal? I don't know of any such presentation. Uh, if we had such a presentation, I really think this class would become more tractable. Okay, so that touches on my last topic, the, uh, which, uh, which is about the complexity of recognizing bitransversal matroids. Because there's a very obvious question to ask, how difficult is it to recognize when a transversal matroid is bitransversal? So I give you a bipartite graph, which represents a transversal matroid, and I ask you, is that transversal matroid bitransversal? Is it also co-transversal? If it were easy to do that, if it were easy to answer this question, then you would have some sort of presentation that represents the bitransversal matroid and also certifies it to be bitransversal. And then I think this class would start to become easier to work with. So I think this question is important if you want to understand this class better. Okay, so how difficult is this question? Well, I can give you a trivial upper bound on the complexity of this problem. And I need a little bit of background to, to describe this upper bound. So I'm going to build my way up to an upper bound. Okay, so I will start by thinking about a set of triples. So I'm going to think about triples of the form G1, G2B. G1 and G2 are bipartite graphs. And I will say that they represent transversal matroids having the same ground set. And then I say that B is a basis of the first transversal matroid and a basis complement of the second transversal matroid. Okay, so I just consider the set of all such triples. And because we're in the universe of complexity theory, I'm gonna say language instead of set, but language really means set. Okay, so I will let L naught be that language of triples. Now, my first observation is that this language is in P. This language can be recognized in polynomial time. What do I need to do to check that a triple is in this language? Well, I need to check that the two transversal matroids have the same ground set, that's immediate. And I need to check that B is a basis of the first matroid, a co-basis of the second. Well, that's easy as well. I can just use standard matching algorithms. Uh, so that can be done in polynomial time. So this is a polynomial time language. Okay, L0 is a polynomial time language. I just want you to keep that in your, in your minds as we move on to the next language. We're going to move upwards. Okay, so my next language, L1, is a language consisting of pairs, G1, G2, where they are bipartite graphs and they represent transversal matroids having the same ground set. And furthermore, those transversal matroids are dual to each other. Okay. So now notice that if I have a pair in this language, then any choice of basis B of the first transversal matroid, if I extend that pair into a triple by adding B on the end, then I get a triple which is in L naught, okay? Because any basis of the first transversal matroid will be a basis complement of the second transversal matroid. That's what duality means. Okay, so any choice of pair in L1 in, and any choice of basis B will extend that pair into a triple in L naught. And I can represent that symbolically by saying that L1 is the language that I get by applying a universal quantifier to L0. L1 is a language in P. So that means that L1 is in the class of languages that I get by applying a universal quantifier to P. And that class of languages is known as Pi1, but it's better known as CoNP. 
So what I've really done here is I've given a complicated explanation of the fact that this language L1 is in CoNP. And that's actually pretty obvious if you think about it. CoNP means the languages where it's easy for me to convince you that a, that a pair is not in the language. So if you give me a pair which is not an L1, it's easy for me to convince you that it's not an L1, because all I need to do is give you a basis of one of those matroids that is not a basis complement of the other matroid. And such a pair will exist because these two matroids are not dual to each other. Okay, so what I've done here is I've demonstrated that L1 is a co-NP language. And so why have I done it in this complicated way? Because I, the reason that I've done it in this complicated way is I want to take another step upwards. Because the language we really care about is the language of bitransversal matroids. Okay, so I will let L2 be that language. So L2 just consists of bipartite graphs G1 representing bitransversal matroids. And notice that if G1 is in this language, so if G1 is representing a bitransversal matroid, then there exists some bipartite graph G2 such that G1, G2 is in the language L1. Okay, because L1 is the language of pairs of, bi of bipartite graphs representing dual matroids. Okay, so being an L2 means you are bitransversal. That means that there exists some bipartite graph representing the dual matroid. So you can extend G1 to a pair G1, G2, which is in the language L1. Okay, I represent that symbolically by saying that L2 is the language that I get by applying an existential quantifier to L1. L1 is in the class of languages pi1. So L2 is in the class of languages that I get by applying the existential quantifier to pi1. And that class of languages is known as sigma2. And now we have arrived at a trivial upper bound for the language of bitransversal graphs. It is in the class of languages sigma2. So we've established ourselves in the polynomial hierarchy. So the polynomial hierarchy is a class of, it's a, it's a, it's a collection of complexity classes of languages. It starts at the base with the class of polynomial time languages. Above that, we have the familiar classes of NP and CoNP. And above them, we have the classes Sigma2 and Pi2. So we have just placed the complexity of bitransversality in here, in Sigma2. So we've placed it above NP. So the difficulty of this problem is potentially harder than all the problems in NP, which makes it quite a hard problem. But is that the true picture? Is that actually the location of bitransversality? Does it really live up here? I don't think so. Uh, so this is work in progress by myself, Nick Brattel, uh, George Drummond, Mina Maria Joes, and Jerry Toft. Uh, last year, we had a workshop for New Zealand-based matroid people in Nelson and South Island, and this group of people started thinking about bitransversal matroids. By the end of the week, we had settled on a conjecture, which turned out to be false, uh, but we've improved that conjecture, which may be true. And if that conjecture is true, then it will put the complexity of this problem into NP. So we will have located it further down the polynomial hierarchy. We will have moved it from sigma two into NP. Okay, well, is that where the complexity of this problem lives? I actually don't think so. I think there is a chance that this language could be in co-NP also. So that would place it in NP and also co-NP. Uh, so I won't say more now about why I believe it's in, it might be in CoNP. I'm, I'm not confident about that, but it's plausible to me that the problem is in CoNP. 
Um, I won't go into the reasons now for the purposes of saving some time. But, okay, so it is plausible to me that the complexity of bitransversality is in NP and also in co-NP. And at that point, you might start thinking that this problem is actually easy. Problems in here, problems that sit in NP and also co-NP, they have a history of dropping into P, given enough time and enough hard work. Um, if it's sitting in NP and also in co-NP, it seems to be a sign that there is some hidden structure, structure that we may not yet be aware of, but if you become aware of it, then it drops the complexity of the problem down into P. So I am actually going to go ahead and um, just conjecture that the complexity of testing by transversality is in P. This is possibly not a very wise conjecture. I mean, at the moment, all I know is that it's in sigma two. Sigma two is a long way from P. It's strictly above NP. Well, I assume it's strictly above NP. So yeah, we're, we're quite a long way from knowing- Sorry, that Dylan, can I just, that's uh, this conjecture, um... Are you assuming you're given a transversal representation or are you just? Right. Yeah. Um, the complexity of this problem is given a transversal matroid represented by a bipartite graph, how difficult is it to test that that matroid is co-transversal always also? Yeah, that's the complexity of, that's the problem I want to consider. Uh, yeah, okay. So I'm not sure if this is a sensible conjecture. It might be a little bit rash. You only live once though, so I'll just go ahead and conjecture it. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. I will stop there. Uh, thank you so much, Dylan. Uh, let's do a round of applause if everyone can unmute and then I'll count to three and then we'll clap. One, two, three. Thanks, Shelley. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so does anyone have any questions? You can go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was wondering um, how this relates to positroids. The, the cyclic class looked a bit positroid-like. Yeah, I. That's exactly what I asked um, Joe Bonin um, some years ago, and he told me the answer is no. They're not exactly the same. Um, positroids are gamoids. And they're gamoids that arise from directed graphs having a particular cyclic structure. Um, so they are vertices, uh, they're, they're planar directed graphs and you have the cycle around the outside and you have a bunch of vertices in the middle of this planar graph. And there's some rule about um, our, I think maybe the graphs on the inside are allowed out degree one or something like that. And then the target vertices are that you need to link to in order to be independent. Those are exactly the vertices around the outside. So the positroids are gamoids, but they don't line up exactly with the class of multipath matroids. I think I've got that correct. Right. Uh, and the other thing is that that, that class, they, uh, you can certify this means not a positroid by using this theorem that describes its basis polytope, I think. Oh, yeah. So I was wondering if that might be a, a, an approach to do these things have nice polytopes associated with them. Interesting idea. Yeah. What I, the, so, I mean, now that we're, we're kind of off the clock, um, I'll say a little bit more about why I was thinking by transversality might be in co-NP. Uh, to, to, to show that it's in co-NP, there needs to be a way of quickly convincing you that it's dual is not transversal. How do I convince you that a matroid is not transversal? Well, I can use the Mason-Ingleton inequality. The problem is that the certificate from the Mason-Ingleton inequality is potentially exponentially large compared to the ground set. But I think it's plausible that under the right circumstances, there will always exist 
a Mason and Ingleton certificate, which is small, which is polynomially sized. If that's true, then the problem falls into co-MP. Uh, I'm not saying that's definitely true, but I wouldn't be surprised if it were true. So I think that would be, that's a way that the problem might fall into co-MP. I hadn't thought about the basis polytopes. Um, I don't know anything about the polytopes of multipath of, of um, by transversal matroids. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, for polytroids, it turned out that there's some sort of cyclic thing that the, the, the things have to arrange cyclically. And then there was, I think there's something like uh, only polynomially many cyclic flats or something like that. And then. Ah, oh, that's you, very interesting. You can use the fact that there's only polynomially many cyclic flats that I can just say, well, I can, I can, if it's not, I can show you too many. And if. Yeah. And if there's only polynomially many, then I can just show you that they're not arranged correctly. That's really interesting because I was thinking about that sort of approach just last week. Um, and unfortunately, in a bitransversal matroid, you can still have exponentially many cyclic flats. Uh, but I, yeah, so that, that, a approach won't immediately work for bitransversal matroids, but I think if you can get some kind of control over how many cyclic flats are going to be in a Mason Ingleton certificate, that's that would be that's a strategy to try out. I don't really know how to proceed though. Yeah, sure. Now, now that I said it, I wasn't 100 percent sure there was there had to be two conditions. It wasn't just cyclic flats. There was a polynomial many. There were polynomially many uh, constraints in the basis polytope anyway. So that was the, and then those things corresponded to certain kinds of flats, but I think there were special kinds of cyclic flats. They weren't just arbitrary cyclic flats that gave you things. Oh, I, should, um, I should take a look at that work. That sounds like it will be very relevant. Um, what do you know about uh, transversal matroids that emit a given uniform minor? as opposed to bounding the branch width. I don't know anything about that that class. Because I mean, I, I would guess that if you have a transversal matroid emitting a uniform minor, then it should be something like a bicircular matroid. It, that, it should be quite structured, shouldn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, like I like bicircular matroids are certainly in that class and they don't contain huge uniform minors. So whatever you can do for graphs will happen there. But yeah. But it might be that if you're if you're not if you emit a uniform minor and a bicircular minor, then and you're not bicircular, then something happens. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Um, yeah, it's funny that you, you're so optimistic about this class, and I think I think you've convinced me. But it contains all uniform matroids, which is a little bit of theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I might be wrong, right? Like by transversal could be quite wild. Um, but there are some, I think there are some reasons to be optimistic that it is controllable. Or at least it, it contains some really controllable classes, right? The fundamental matroids are really controllable. Multipath matroids are really controllable. And though, like my perception is that those are quite big chunks of bitransversal matroids, but that could be really naive. It might just be that those are the bitransversal matroids that I've worked with because they're controllable. So um, perhaps there's a big universe of bitransversal matroids out there that's much wilder. Yeah, um, I think a, a, a lot of it would depend on the like the answer to this conjecture. If this conjecture is true, then I, I really think bitransversal matroids will be on the tame side of the spectrum. Um, otherwise, it it could be it could be wild. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording there. Thanks again, Dylan. Thanks, everyone, for coming.